Merkle trees are everywhere in blockchain. And in the previous video, we covered what these Merkle trees actually are and how they work. Now you might have noticed a sneaky little problem with these Merkle trees. And that was that we calculate them and store them off chain. The only part of the Merkle tree that we're actually storing on chain is the Merkle root. Now, what happens if we need to update these trees? What happens if we need someone to add an address to our allow list, add a name to our list of names? We'd have to have some centralized person come in, add the value to the Merkle tree and then recalculate the root hash, which would be incredibly centralized and require trust for all of the users. Not particularly ideal. But then if we had to store the Merkle tree on chain and then add a leaf to the tree on chain, we'd have to recalculate the whole tree on chain. And that sounds incredibly expensive. And at probably at the point we'd run out of gas because we'd have to do so many iterations of calculations and it was just not going to be possible. So what's the solution? Luckily, there is one. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. And that is incremental Merkle trees. Let's get into it. In this video, we are going to be going into incremental Merkle trees and how they actually work to enable us to have Merkle trees stored entirely on chain and be updatable so that we can add values to our Merkle trees. Incremental Merkle trees or IMTs are the trick for efficient, scalable and updatable on chain Merkle trees. You can think of this video as your technical deep dive into IMTs. What they are, and how they work conceptually. So that when you're trying to understand how blockchains like ZK Sync work or how applications like Tornado Cash work, then this video will be very helpful for you. So I encourage you to stick around till the end. Before we get into things, let's do a little recap of Merkle trees. So a Merkle tree is a data structure that enable efficient data storage and verification. So we can verify that a piece of data is in fact in a group of data. And these trees are constructed through a hierarchical hashing process. So adjacent leave nodes, the pieces of data at the bottom are hashed together, and then the resulting parent nodes are similarly paired and hashed, continuing upwards until a single hash value emerges, which we call the Merkle root. Standard Merkle trees are stored off chain and only the root is stored on chain. When a user wants to verify data presence, they simply need to provide the leaf value. So the pre-image for the hash of that leaf that they want to verify and a Merkle proof, which is the intermediate nodes that are needed to reconstruct the tree. The smart contract would then recalculate the tree and calculate a Merkle root using their original data and the Merkle proof. And then the smart contract would then compare this calculated root with a root that's stored in the smart contract. However, in some blockchain applications, we need this data to be dynamic. We need the entire Merkle tree to be accessible on chain and we need to be able to add or change values in the Merkle tree. Crucially, we need to do this in a decentralized way. And one such example of an application which requires a dynamic Merkle tree where you can add values to the tree is Tornado Cash, in which deposits are added to the tree incrementally. When a user creates a new deposit, the tree must be updated to include that deposit. And with this standard approach, we would have to recalculate the entire tree for every every single new deposit. And deposits would not end up going through as transaction execution could exceed the block limit, causing these transactions to fail. Therefore, we have two primary requirements. We need to store the Merkle tree on chain to maintain trustlessness, but we also need to be able to efficiently add leaves to the Merkle tree without having to recalculate the entire tree. And the solution for this, of course, is incremental Merkle trees. An incremental Merkle tree is a Merkle tree, which is a fixed depth where each leaf is initially populated with a zero value. We're going to go through what these two different things mean in a second. Incremental Merkle trees are specifically optimized to allow you to add new leaves to the tree without having to recalculate the tree structure. This allows you to store the tree on chain, add new leaves sequentially and update the Merkle root with minimal computations. <laughs> Let's go into how this actually works. Incremental Merkle trees are of fixed size, and that makes intuitive sense to say that there are a fixed number of leaves in the tree, and therefore a maximum amount of data that can be present in the tree. When we describe the size of a Merkle tree, we refer to it as its depth or the number of levels. But what does fixed depth or number of levels mean? The depth of a Merkle tree is the number of hops or hash operations from any leaf node to the root. For example, a tree requiring two hash operations from leaf to root has a depth of two. And sometimes this is also referred to as the height of the tree. So a height of two. Looking at this tree, we can see there are three hash operations that are needed to traverse from the leaf nodes to the root hash. Therefore, this tree has a depth of 
three. The levels are the distinct layers in the tree hierarchy. The leaves are considered level zero. And for example, a tree of depth three has four distinct levels, including the leaves. So level zero is the leaves. Then we have level one, level two, and level three. And we describe each node in the tree using indices, which are zero indexed, just like the levels. So we can have leaves of index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in this depth three tree. We have 0, 1, 2, 3 levels in this depth three tree. And then we also have the intermediate nodes, which have indices at level one. We have indices 0, 1, 2, 3. At level two, we have indices 0 and 1. And then we have the root hash at level three. Given a certain tree depth D, we can actually calculate how many leaves there are going to be in the tree. So this is the leaf nodes, not including any intermediate hashes. And to do that, we can use this following equation, two to the power of the depth. And this is actually a little bit intuitive since adding a level to the tree means doubling the number of leaves present. And this is because every intermediate node has two child nodes. So if we add a level to the tree, it's effectively like adding the leaves below what were originally the leaves. So let's say we have a tree of depth two. This would mean we would have two to the power of two or four child nodes. Then if we add a level, so now we have a depth three tree, we would have to have two child nodes below each intermediate node. And these intermediate nodes are actually what were our leaves in the depth two tree. And this means that the number of leaf nodes has doubled. Therefore, there are two to the power of two, which was four times two, which is equal to two to the power of three, which is equal to eight leaves. So each time we add a level, the number of leaf nodes doubles. Therefore, we can conclude that the relationship between the number of leaves and the depth is the number of leaves is equal to two to the power of the depth. So let's say we have a tree of depth 20, as in tornado cache. This means we would have two to the power of 20 leaves. And since we pair up each of these leaves when we create our Merkle tree, this would mean we would have two to the power of 20 divided by two or two to the power of 19 hash calculations to do just to calculate level one. And if this is done on chain, this is a lot of calculations that need to be done just for that one level, let alone to get all the way to the root hash. Luckily, we do have a more efficient way of doing this. And incremental Merkle trees use a combination of initially populating the tree with zero values and caching of any calculated values. So we initially populate the tree with zero values. And then we use these zero value leaves to calculate some initial intermediate nodes and root hash. Now you might think the hash of zero with zero is zero. So therefore the root hash is obviously gonna be zero, but this zero value isn't actually zero. We just refer to it as zero, which is a little bit confusing. And it's usually just a constant value. For instance, for tornado cache, this constant value is the hash of the string tornado. So this zero is simply a constant value. So let's consider again a tree of depth three, which of course has eight leaves. Initially, we populate every leaf node with the constant value, for example, the string tornado. The intermediate nodes, well, technically actually something called a zero subtree for every depth up to the maximum depth, which we're going to define in a second, are pre-calculated for every level up to the root hash and stored in the smart contract before deployment. So I mentioned this word subtree very briefly. Let's define what this means because we're going to need this terminology going forward. So a subtree is any node and its descendants within the main tree. And this can be considered a Merkle tree in its own right and is referred to as a subtree. Every single node in the tree can be considered the root of its own subtree. Even a single leaf node can be considered a Merkle tree of height zero or depth zero. When we store these intermediate nodes, these zero intermediate nodes, in practice, what we're actually doing is storing subtrees of every single depth up to the depth of the main Merkle tree. So for instance, if we had a Merkle tree of depth three, we would need to store a single zero leaf node or a subtree of depth zero, a subtree of depth one, a subtree of depth two. However, the depth three tree, so the full Merkle tree, does not actually need to be stored in the smart contract. And this is because we'll never actually need it in any calculations. Because when we add our first leaf to the tree, when we hash it with other values, we're never actually going to need to hash it with the zero root hash. This is gonna become a little bit clearer as we go on why you're not gonna need this full zero Merkle tree. When we add a leaf to the Merkle tree, we actually use these pre-calculated zero subtrees to calculate a new updated root hash once we add a value. So how do we actually add a leaf to the incremental Merkle tree? When we add a value to the tree, we simply replace the zero leaf with the desired value. And this is done left to right. So if no nodes have yet been added or replaced, the first value we want to add to the tree replaces the zero value stored in index zero. So the leftmost leaf. And the last node to be replaced will be the rightmost leaf. Consider again this tree of depth three. Let's say we're in the process of adding a leaf with an index of four. The occupied leaves are colored in yellow 
yellow and the unoccupied zero value leaves are colored in blue. The node that we are adding is colored in green and the nodes that need to be recalculated are colored in red. And there's two helpful things that we can notice here. Everything to the left of the leaf is unchanged. It has already been added or calculated and can therefore be cached. And everything to the node's right is still a zero value and is considered unoccupied. So let's go into a little bit about that caching of the subtrees, all of the data on the left of the node being added. So once we fill an entire subtree, we can cache this value in the smart contract to use later. By caching filled subtrees, we can reduce the number of calculations. Once a subtree has been populated, it never needs to be recomputed. When we add a new leaf to an incremental Merkle tree, we don't need to update and store every single intermediate node as we didn't with the zero intermediate nodes. Instead, we store them, of course, as subtrees. And when we add a new leaf node, we only need to store certain subtree roots. The minimal set needed to construct the overall root. When we insert a new leaf to the tree, we only need to recompute the path from the leaf to the root, updating any hashes we need as we go. But we only need to cache the roots of the smallest set of non-overlapping subtrees that fully represent the current state of the tree. So you can think of it as covering the occupied tree portion with as few large subtrees rather than caching every single intermediate step. And this set will always correspond to the binary representation of the index of the leaf we are inserting assuming that we're zero indexing. So looking, of course, at this step three tree, we are inserting the leaf with index four. Four in binary is one zero zero. Therefore, we'd need to cache one subtree of depth two, zero subtrees of depth one, and zero subtrees of depth zero. Let's take another example. Let's say we have this tree of depth four. Let's say we wanted to insert the leaf with the index 13. 13 in binary is one one zero one, which would mean that we'd need one subtree of depth three, one subtree of depth two, zero subtrees of depth one and one subtree of depth zero. And then these subtree roots are all that you need to reconstruct the entire tree. You don't need to store anything in between. I mean, the only data we need is three Merkle roots rather than storing all of the intermediate nodes, all of the leaf hashes, etc., which dramatically reduces the amount of data which we need to store on chain. Now, this still might sound a little bit confusing because we still need to go into a little bit more detail about how this actually works. So there's one final piece to the puzzle until we can understand how all of this fits together, and that is hashing order. When we add a node to the tree, we must hash it with its adjacent node. So considering the diagram again, when we add leaf four, we must hash it with the constant zero value stored in leaf five. But how do we know the order in which to hash leaves? How do we know without looking at the tree and determining which one it's next to, how do we know whether to calculate the hash of leaf four with leaf five or the hash of leaf five with leaf four? So the answer is that hashing is done left to right. This means that leaves must be hashed in this following order. So you'll notice that the even index nodes are positioned on the left and must be hashed with the node on the right. And odd index nodes must be positioned on the right and then hash with the node on the left. And we know from before that everything on the right of the node that we are adding is going to be a zero value. And everything on the left of the node that we are adding must be a pre-calculated cached value. So let's return again to when we are adding a leaf to the tree. So if the leaf node that we're adding has an even index, it must be positioned on the left of the hash operation and it must be hashed with a leaf node on the right. And this will be, of course, an unoccupied zero value leaf node, which will be stored in the smart contract as a zero subtree of depth zero. If the leaf that we're adding has an odd index, it must be positioned on the right of the hash operation and must be hashed with the leaf node on the left. And this will be an occupied leaf node and will be stored in the smart contract as a cached subtree of depth zero. And the same is true when updating intermediate nodes. We can look at the index of the intermediate node and then work out whether it needs to be the left or the right of the hash operation and therefore whether it needs to be hashed with a cached subtree or a pre-calculated zero subtree. And if the resulting intermediate node that we calculate contains no zero values in its subtree, then it needs to be cached and stored in the smart contract, ready to be used when we add more leaves to the tree. Let's go through the process of adding even and odd nodes to our tree to understand how this is all working together. Let's start with adding an even index node to our 
depth three tree. Let's say we are adding an even node at index four. Since the index is even, we need to store the inserted leaf as a cached subtree of depth zero. This is true of any index which is even, we would need to store that in the smart contract as we would need to use it when we add leaf five. Since the leaf has an even index, we must hash it with the leaf node to its right at index five. And this is a zero subtree of depth zero since it's on the right. We then take the result, which is intermediate node with the index of two, and then we hash that with the subtree of depth one. Since the intermediate node has an even index, it needs to be placed on the left of the hash function. And the zero subtree, this time of depth one, needs to be positioned on the right of the hash. We then take the result, an intermediate node with an index of one, which is now at level two, and we hash that with a subtree of depth two. Since it has an odd index, it must be positioned on the right of the hash function and will therefore be hashed with a cache subtree of depth two on the left. We can then store the result as the updated Merkle root. Let's now go through the same process, but for adding an odd index. Let's say we are now adding another leaf node now at the odd index of five. Since it has an odd index, it doesn't need to be stored as a cache subtree. So we don't need to use it when we add the index six. And since it has an odd index, we must hash it with the leaf node to the left at index four, which will be a cache subtree of depth zero. So on the left of the hash function, we have the cache subtree of depth zero. And on the right, we have the index five leaf that we are adding. We can then cache the result as a cache subtree of depth one since there are no zero values in this newly produced subtree. So then we take the result, which is an intermediate node of index two, and we hash it with a subtree of depth one. Since the intermediate node has an even index, it needs to be placed on the left of the hash. And of course, on the right, we will have a zero subtree this time of depth one. We then take the result, which will be an intermediate node of index one at level two and hash it with a subtree of depth two. Since it has an odd index, it must be placed on the right of the hash and therefore on the left of the hash, we would have a cache subtree of depth two. We would then store this result as the updated Merkle root as we did before. So as you can see, by pre-computing and storing zero subtrees and by caching any populated calculated subtrees, we have reduced the number of calculations that are required to recalculate the tree when we add a leaf node. So this means that for our depth three tree, we would only require calculating three new subtree roots, including the new updated Merkle root. And this actually allows us to store these Merkle trees in smart contracts and update them without incurring any unbounded loops and subsequent denial of service attacks. And they are extremely useful in on-chain applications which require updatable Merkle trees such as Tornado Cash or blockchains like ZK Sync. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and leave me a little tree emoji down below in the comments if you got this far. Or if you have any questions or don't understand things, then also leave your questions down below. Bye!